Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third annual Native Plant Symposium. My name is Jessica McCauley with the Prince William Soil and Water Conservation District, and I will be moderating this presentation today. I'm very honored to introduce Nancy Berlin, who will be presenting Establishing and Maintaining Meadows. Nancy enjoys her work currently serving Prince William County, Manassas City, and Manassas Park as a natural resource specialist and coordinator of the Virginia Cooperative Extension Master Gardener Program since 2007. She studied natural resources at Virginia Tech's graduate program. The Prince William Master Gardener Program has over 200 active, highly trained volunteers who serve as environmental educators, teaching our community sustainable landscaping, savvy lawn care, effective and research-based pest management as a last alternative, as well as wildlife and water quality programs. Staff and volunteers in the Master Gardener Program have been involved in the launching of many community gardens and other collaborative projects. I might add that I am a Master Gardener intern and I highly recommend it to anyone who might be interested. Nancy has her own beautiful meadow she visits every day in the spring and summer. This presentation is a great opportunity to learn from her research and experiences. At the end of the presentation, we will have a 10 minute Q&A in the chat box. You can type your questions there at any time and I will relay them to Nancy and she will answer them at the end. And now here's Nancy Berlin presenting Establishing and Maintaining Meadows. Hey, this is one of my favorite topics. I'm glad to be talking with you today about it. And Jess gives me hope for the, she's the same age as my children. And so she gives me hope for the next generation picking up the baton here because I'm getting older. Um, so let's define a meadow first. Um, for a biologist, it's a grassland where plants flower and drop their seeds. And, and it's not a, a place where animals graze. But to a farmer, meadows were traditionally grasslands that were either mown to make hay or used as um, forage for, for livestock. Um, but for us today, and for most people, we're gonna call it a flat or a sloping or a lowland grassland or simply a flower rich grassland. And I emphasize the word grassland for a reason, which will become apparent as we talk more. So this is a picture of Chanticleer's garden, um, Chanticleer is in Wayne, Pennsylvania. It's one of my favorite gardens. I don't, not all of the plants in this, you see some goldenrods represented, but not all the plants in this are, are native, but you can see how they've done a kind of a design. And a, a meadow is about 50 to 70% native grasses or sedges. And so that, and that, um, there's no woody vegetation in it. So it's predominantly grass. And that will make um, maintenance certainly much easier. There, and there's no woody vegetation. Uh, there's diverse plant groups, varied bloom times, varied plant height and, and flower color, and it provides a habitat. So here's some, here's some myths uh, that I hear a lot about meadows. It's really easy to just achieve a colorful flower-filled meadow spring through fall, no problem. Not true. <laughs> Meadows and meadows require little to no maintenance. People, a lot of, a lot of our clients want to um, start a meadow so they never have to mow again. And honestly, mowing um, less is, is a, a, one of the benefits of a meadow, but it doesn't require no maintenance. And you know those meadow in a can that you can buy? <laughs> you can't simply scatter the seeds and have a, a meadow. It does take some management and some planning. And most of those meadow in a can um, are annuals that you, you probably don't want a whole meadow of annuals that you'll have to reseed every year. Um, there's some challenges certainly to establishing a meadow. There's a lot of poor instructional material out there. I would encourage you to read um, a, a reputable source, a .edu or a .ext after your search terms, or uh, to get an extension publication, or um, Virginia Native Plant Society, or Sangha. Uh, there's a lot of local resources. Sometimes there can be a shortage of the natives that you want. Um, that's becoming less and less of a problem as we, we get more and more native plant vendors. It does take some persistence to have a meadow. 
um, it builds your character. And a lot of people, again, have those unrealistic expectations because of the myths. That's, that's Penstemon digitalis, a beard tongue on the left with um, raindrops coming off. And that's a great meadow plant, really sturdy, even though it looks so gentle. Um, so here's some reasons why you might be in this seminar today. You might wanna do less mowing, provide habitat, um, provide seeds and cover and nesting material for the birds in your neighborhood. You might wanna do it as an example of stewardship. I'm stewarding the land that I have and taking care of it. A meadow could also absorb some of your stormwater and reduce erosion. And there's no need to use fat fertilizers or pesticides. And this is my favorite, endless learning opportunities. Um, every day I learn something new and, and my plants are teaching me what they need. And a meadow with native plants thrives in poor soil. And by poor soil, I mean native soil that we have clay. So here's, here's a um, aerial shot of my humble abode, really modest house in a neighborhood without an HOA. Um, and you can see I've made some paths in the meadow. This is taken, uh, it's, it's grown immensely since that time. And I've started to add a few shrubs as I get older. I can't manage all the property. So uh, I'm, I tend to put some um, shrubs and, and trees in there to make it a little easier on my back. On the left, you'll see that was the first year I did a meadow and I had a lot of annuals in there and they're, not all of them are native. Um, and so I, I, I've morphed that into a native meadow with a lot more diversity. And some of those plants are still coming up. In the bottom left-hand corner, you see Monarda fistulosa and Heliopsis, um, th that fall sunflower. And um, those are both really good meadow plants. We'll talk about a little bit more later. Meadows are off, also used for, um, for stormwater, excuse me, stormwater management. Um, I had a problem area in my yard. It's not a meadow, but you can see that that slope is pretty steep and plants do a really good job of uh, holding that soil in. At Wolf Trap, they put in a, a stormwater pond, a dry pond, and they, they uh, seeded it and plugged it with um, meadow plants. And that makes for a, a much better looking, um, a much better looking stormwater pond. Maybe you don't have room for a whole meadow, but you could do a vegetated swale or this mini meadow here in a parking area. So your yard is really important. We think of our yard as being just a small slice of our, you know, of life. But if, if Doug Tallamy says that when, as gardeners, we use native plants, they, that we can have just a beautiful landscape, but even more important, we can protect biodiversity. Doug Tallamy has a new program, Homeground National Park. I encourage you to go to this website. And in the past, we've said that, um, oops, one. In, in the past, we've always wanted our gardens to be pretty, but now we need them to support life, to sequester carbon, to feed pollinators and to manage water. So he, um, as part of this program, he's mapping so people can join their yards together and create small national parks with a pathway for pollinators to navigate and other wildlife to navigate. So here's a, you probably know this already, but here's a comparison of meadow versus turf. With a meadow, um, you you'd only need to um, mow it annually, if that, if that, and there's no irrigation except when I'm establishing new plants. They definitely need more babying. Um, no fertilizers or pesticides, and you need some weed control when you're doing the site plan and, and with establishment. Once, once the meadow gets going, you can, you can go into the meadow briefly and, and do some weeding. For turf though, um, it requires that weekly mowing and um, irrigation. And, and turf is a incredibly labor intense crop. It requires fertilizer. If you're gonna have thick turf, you need to have that turf uh, fertilized every year in the fall. Um, and, and so converting that turf to a meadow uh, means less input in herbicides, pesticides, and weed control. Now let's talk a little bit about site assessment. Um, you, wanna, you wanna have a soil test uh, possibly or, or take a, 
take a look at what kind of soil you have and, and how compacted it is. You might wanna draw a diagram of the area that you've selected. Do you have wildlife? Do you need deer resistant plants um, or gra groundhog dug holes? Three burrows under my front meadow. So it's a really good habitat. <laughs> um, decide what size and I'd urge you to go small at first. Is it adjacent to a riparian area or a, you know, a stream or a wooded area? Um, stay on your property, not on the right of way. What kind of sun exposure have you got? Because that's going to make, make it possible for you to pick the right plants for the right meadow. Are there plants and trees present? I have a front yard meadow that's full sun and I have a backyard meadow that's under a walnut tree. And that's pretty challenging, but I found a lot of plants that grow really well under there. Um, is there a slope and is, is it wet or dry? That will affect the, the management of it and, and the plants that you select. And are you gonna have to deal with tree roots? Okay, so size and function. These are three pictures of the life stages of the Asian ladybug, uh, pupa, larva, and uh, mating adults. And I was thrilled to find all of these just right outside my front door. Um, and, and it's, it's just really fun to learn in, in my meadow every day. Um, do you want it for pollinators, a cutting garden, aesthetics? I hope for, hope for all of the above that you would select having a, a meadow for that, those reasons. So consider your topography in your yard. This is my backyard. The, the big tree on the left is the black walnut and just past that uh, bluebird house is the meadow area. So find out where the last place the snow melts is the coolest and the least sunny place in your yard. So take a look now in the winter, we're gonna get some snow tomorrow, huh? that would be a good time to look. Or watch after spring rains for low spots for placement of plants that like red feet, like this cardinal flower, um, native perennial. So the next step, again, shady areas are possible, but pick a sunny visible spot for the most variety. Uh, consider an area that adjoins another habitat. And you're gonna remove turf. I'm not gonna to speak to herbicides because I'm gonna give you three alternatives to herbicides, um, but you're gonna either smother it or solarize it um, to, to get rid of the turf area. And um, native plants prefer that poor soil. Get a plan to remove the weeds and the grasses and keep the edges neat if that's important to you. Um, and then order plugs and plants and seeds native to your echo region. So specific to Northern Virginia, those are the plants that you want to use. Decide if you need deer resistant plants. A few more steps, make sure you include that large percentage of native grasses. Um, plants will need watering weekly, more often for plugs and seeds. You gotta monitor this closely when you're establishing your meadow. Fall is usually a more forgiving time in our climate, but who knows what we're, what we're up against next fall. Um, seeding is a little tricky. You need good soil to seed contact and adequate moisture. And most seeds can be just scratched into the soil. You do not want to till and disturb the soil because that's going to bring up all the eons of weed seeds that are under there. So, so any seeding that you do should disturb the soil as little as possible. Learn what the seedlings look like so you don't weed them up by mistake. Um, and NRCS, um, has a if you I, that's in my resources at the end they have a, a an excellent guide to um, native plant seedlings but what I like to do is um, sow my sow a few seeds in pots so that I can look and watch them grow and then I really recognize them. Don't mulch or fertilize. I, the only place I mulch is around the edges if I want to keep it neat and plan for filling in or the next phases and that's a flea bane daisy ridgeron. Uh, all closed up and getting ready to pop open. That's a nice native plant that tends to be a bit aggressive, but there are places in my yard that I'm glad I have it. Um, so get to know what rules of your HOA. I don't have an HOA to deal with, but um, know, what, know what's ahead and get to know your neighbors and kind of tell them what you're doing. Consider the Audubon at Home program. Master Gardeners in Prince William County will visit your yard for free and talk with you about ways to improve your habitat. We're not there to judge your landscaping or your weeds or anything like that. We're there to help you and encourage you to be certified as an Audubon at Home participant. 
the Prince William County Watershed Branch is a good good thing to contact them if you're with a, a drawing of what you're planning on doing so that if any neighbors, not, no, I hope not, but if any neighbors should complain, you have a landscape plan on file with the Prince William County Watershed Branch. And be prepared to provide advantages and, and a short elevator speech. Every time I'm out in my yard, even in the winter, people stop by, they want to know about plant, what plant that is and what I, you know, they have a million questions. And so be prepared with that and maybe be prepared to give them a package of native plant seeds. And that, I love to do that too. Or I've even dug up plants for them. <laughs> so this is yarrow. This is a really great native plant. That's the straight species. Let's talk about site preparation. Um, solarizing is an environmentally healthy, I mean, friendly method. Um, and so what you're basically doing is you're taking uh, clear plastic during warm or to hot weather, and you're gonna make sure that you water the area really good first because th that steam is what that develops and the condensation under the plastic is what really helps do the trick. And you leave it on the plastic on for about four weeks after watering it and tamp the sides down, you know, with rocks or, or bury them under soil. And then you remove the plastic and then you're fair, it's fairly ready to plant. Um, and that and you, if you get the right plastic, if you get thicker plastic, you can reuse that. I have plastic that I've used three or four years now in different areas of my yard. A similar uh, process would be occultation, just means cut off from view. And this way you're using black plastic instead of, um, in, in it, if you can leave this on for about two weeks during warm weather, uh, you can even do it now uh, during the winter and cut and leave it until spring. <laughs> when I pulled mine, I, I did this too, just to test it out. And I, when I pulled mine back, I found like three ring neck snakes, one decays brown snake and a whole bunch of garter snakes that had taken refuge under there and eaten all the insects, I think. Um, a third way is to just put a really thick layer of uh, arborist chips on your on on the area that you want to have your your meadow established, and I'm talking five inches thick. Um, and, and just leave, you could do that now. Let them sit, and then pull them back uh, to do planting. Or you know they might have deteriorated by then. They they break down pretty quickly, and they add to the soil. University of Washington has done a lot of um, great research on this. Um, here's the, all you have to do is call Novec. I don't think you have to be a customer of them and get a chip and ask for the chip drop. It is a lot of chips though. You gotta be prepared for that. Um, and I've still got a huge pile in my driveway. But let's talk about fun, fun stuff, plant selection. Determine what your budget is. You know, how much money do you have to play with here? There's, Never enough. <laughs> I always want more plants. Select maybe to start. Select three to five species of a native of native plants. Now make those local natives. If you live in Northern Virginia, you want that echo region. Okay, you plant them in drifts, like Alonzo was talking about, in masses instead of one or two plants. Plant six and plant them cl close together, and the pollinators can spot them easier. Um, plan for nectar flow. Alonzo mentioned this too, that you have something blooming throughout the season that will support wildlife and pollinators. Think about layers. This is the blossom layer, then the leaves and the stems, the litter layer and the soil layer. And the more that you get coverage, although we do want some bare spots, right, for those, those native bees. Um, but do you have to have it tidy? I mean, are you in a community where it would really not go over well to not have it tidy? Then look for a more designed look. Uh, you can see some designs. These guys don't always use native plants. Larry Wiener does, but Thomas Renier, Pete Ondoff will, can give you some ideas about how you can get a more designed, tidy look. It will be less diverse and you'll see it'll be less attractive to wildlife, but if that's gonna uh, make a difference in your community, then you might wanna consider that. Now I opt for the messier look and it's more diverse and probably more attractive to wildlife. And, and I, I see so much activity in my yard, um, even in the winter time. So here's, here's a shot from my front yard meadow. And you can see, I, these are about, you stick with three, three to five, three to seven species, two to three blooming at one time. 
Uh, these are spider warts, and which typically are a very low plant, low to the ground, a couple inches off the ground. And these are reaching for the sun. They are about five feet tall with very long stems. Um, so they plants adjust. And, and bee balm, this is all bee balm here. That that's a mint family and covers very well. There's some tall flocks mixed in there too. And here's the Achillea, the, the, the common yarrow, and there's some milkweed in here too. But that just gives you an idea. And actually, I'm 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 as my plants establish and and choose their own areas, I'm I'm finding that I have more uh, cohesiveness in my yard. Each year it's a little different. So there's some culver's root in here, that very tall culver's root. Uh, oops, excuse me up there. Then the middle layer, you got some coreopsis. The bachelor's buttons is not a native, but I do sew some annuals in for extra color. And on the ground level, I have basil leaves of the yarrow, which looks fern-like, uh, lyre leaf sage, and the fleabane um, actually dies back and leaves a basil leaf that covers the ground very assertively. Avoid planting these in your meadow. And there's probably a million more things that you should avoid, but but these give you um, these are pretty nasty to get rid of. So another plant to avoid is tropical milkweed, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. It can interfere with monarch migration and reproduction. It blooms a little bit later in the season, and it confuses monarchs into thinking they need to breed when they should be migrating. Um, it also causes a problem in as our climate warms, um, th this plant may not die back in the winter completely. And on it grows a protozoan parasite of monarch butterflies. And that can travel in the monarch, visiting the plants and be deposited on the leaves to infect other monarchs. And this is what it looks like. The one on the, this one right here with the X on it is the tropical milkweed. It is a pretty plant, but I do not recommend you ever plant it. Um, this is the native uh, orange butterfly weed, which is gorgeous. This is the one that you, you should plant. So Carvastica versus tuberosa. Okay, here's another shot. Um, I would suggest that, that you stick with straight species, like Alonzo said, you, rather than cultivars. A cultivar is just a plant variety that's been produced for certain characteristics and sometimes genetically modified. Uh, cultivars um, like this one, this is the native, uh, this is not native to Northern Virginia, cultivar, I've heard people call it the gateway flower to get you into native plants, but I, I have some in my yard too, even though it's not native to Northern Virginia, it's native to the East Coast. This is a cultivar and you see it has a fuzzy head and they, what they've done is they've, um, at the expense of many of the flower parts, they've made the head uh, fuzzier and more dramatic. So I had um, an orange version of this uh, cultivar planted right next to my uh, echinacea and these were covered with insects and nobody visited this and this is a sterile plant most of the time too because they don't want you know it's a patented plant. So this is called Pink Double Delight and it, ha it has the cultivar name in single quotes. So you want to avoid cult cultivars if you if you can. Excuse me. I don't know why I'm getting all these people coming in. Okay. So yeah, I have a video to share with you. This is a cultivar of Joe Pie weed. I don't know the name of this particular cultivar. These two films I'm going to show you are were at my friend's house. These plants were side by side. This is the cultivar. It's a little brighter pink. Let's take a look. Okay, now I'm going to show Now I'm, let's see, okay. Now I'm gonna go to the next one. This is the straight species of uh, Joe Pye right next to the other one. It's quite a dramatic example. Um, I'm gonna talk, mention Sam Droji here. If you don't follow him on Instagram, it's the US, GS uh, B Lab. Um, I have a reference at the end. This is his one hour mini meadow. 
um, he put some annuals in here and, and he's got perennials in here. And he says, you know, he got this in in one hour and it's just, he's put aggressive spreaders in. So if you don't mind the whole messy look and you want something that'll fill in, here's, here's what will fit the bill. This is what Sam and I use um, in some areas where I don't ever want to mow again and I, I want it to cover this one area. So fall sunflower, cop plant, Jerusalem artichoke, partridge pea, and Monarda fistulosa, bee balm. And, and, and stick with the straight species on all of these. I, and, and But count the cost because um, these are going to be really aggressive spreaders. But I, I thought that was interesting experiment that he did. So if you aren't seeing a wide variety of pollinators in your landscape, it's likely that you need to ramp up the number of plants you have to increase the diversity. Flowering plants have traits, of course, to attract specific pollinators. And not all pollinators can use the same flowers. So flowering time, density of the flowers, how many flowers there are, the height, um, everything influences. And again, stick with straight species. A pollinator's body size and strength and tongue length also determine, like the long-tongued honeybee, um, bumblebee, can get into a tube-like, tube-shaped flower much easier. So another word about annuals and perennials. If annuals are desired, there are, this is a native, um, native annual, uh, Monarda citadora, and um, it's, it's a lovely plant. And so I do try to plant that every year, but perennials provide more coverage. I sneak some zinnias into my meadow every year where there's a little space. Um, I either plant them as seeds or start them inside. And so I, they are not native to uh, Virginia, but I, they do provide some short-term color and they get a lot of visitors um, and they make good cut flowers. So perennials may not flower that until the second year, especially if you have plugs. So let's talk about the three possibilities here. Seeds, um, of course, are less expensive. There's much more variety, but they're, they're harder to get started. They need adequate moisture. You can't let them dry out. Um, and it, sometimes it's hard to recognize the seedlings. Some you can direct sow. Uh, landscape plugs, I would recommend LP50s. There's smaller ones. LP32s, but LP50s are a little bit more sturdy and forgiving, and, but, but plugs should not be allowed to dry out before you plant them or after you plant them. Um, they're very easy to plant though, if you're going to do a mass planting, but know that your color and your, the, the mature plants won't come that first year. All you have to do is stick your Stick your shovel in and make a little divot and, and plug, the, plug the plug in. Now, most expensive is um, certainly plants, and, but, and they give you instant col color and coverage. Um, we know that um, native plants sleep the first year, creep the second, and leap the third year. And, that, and then you might be able to divide, give to neighbors, move to a bare spot in your yard. Here's a ridge run, a flea bane an aggressive spreader, but does its job well in my yard and keeps the ground covered so weeds don't come in. And it has a delightful flower that's visited by a lot. So I'm gonna go through some pictures of some native plants that, that are meadow friendly, but I can't do that uh, for your specific yard. So you wanna go to Plant Nova Native's website to select plants based on the conditions in your yard. I'm gonna just show you a smattering. You can also contact us at the Extension Office and we'll help you talk through and decide, make some decisions also. So here's some spring low growers, um, bleeding, native bleeding heart, pussy toes, columbine, and uh, coreopsis. Uh, we've got two kinds of violets here and this, this uh, pack or aria is a great for partial sun. And there's that beard tongue, uh, Penstemon digitalis again. Some other partial sun, early summer bloomers, um, the native geranium and columbine. Uh, some of that full sun, early to midsummer blooms. Um, you've, here's your, here you've got the native uh, butterfly weed, not the tropical, and you know Rebecca Herda and these two baptisias. Um, some in the summer, tall or this one you can put on a trellis. This is the native native honeysuckle. Oops, there we go. And three different liatris that are 
um, blazing stars that are um, native to Northern Virginia, some, some Heliopsis, and this is obedient plants. So you can see you can, if you have something blooming at each season, these are some lovely fall bloomers. Uh, got calico aster, Alonzo talked about how important asters are, and two different golden rods here on the two corners. There, these two golden rods. There's there's about five golden rods that you can select, and they are ma magnets for um, good good guys. Um, Verbena hostata, and this is another Rebecca. In the late summer, a, a low ground cover um, that blooms. Um, this this lyre leaf sage is one of my new favorite plants. It retains those purple basil leaves all winter, or maybe some of the carex sedges. They provide a good low cover that keeps keeps the ground covered in the winter or in the summer we, where you have bare spots. And this um, Conoclonium coalescium, the, the blue mist flower is a lovely flower. It's, it's fairly aggressive though. Remember you need the grasses. So um, these are the, these are the um, species that I would recommend you consider. Um, some of them grow better in shade. Some of them grow better in sun. Um, if you go to the Manassas battlefield, you can see all of these in person if, if they go, if you go before they mow. So I've, I've seeded these and I've used plugs, but they still takes a couple years to establish. I think I finally have really good growth after the third year. So, so you gotta be patient. But look at those roots that native plants and native grasses provide. That is incredible erosion control, much better than turf. Um, Native grasses also protect those tall perennials. They keep them from flopping over. And natural meadows, again, contain a lot of grasses and it, it, will, it will make your upkeep uh, much more manageable. So um, for, for uh, here's, some, here's a list of plants. You might wanna take a screenshot of this, although this will be available later uh, recorded, but these are good for partial sun. If you have a partial sun, area and you still want to have a meadow, these, these will make it. And, and for sh more shade, um, I've just started putting that Elemis virginicus in, that wild rye, beautiful. And, but these, these will all survive in the sun. And most of these are in my meadow under my um, want black walnut too. Okay, so I, uh, uh, Alonzo talked about native ours. If you want to read more about native ours, go to Mount Cuba Center's website and read about their research. Doug Tallamy has done some research there with his students. Um, and so a native R is just a, um, a native plant that has uh, some difference genetically or some, some characteristic difference. Like this echinacea that we talked about with the fuzzy, with the fuzzy head. Uh, so nobody likes, none of the pollinators like this. Um, and here's the native one. So because the petals that they made to replace, replace the other floral parts and it limits their ability to even produce pollen, nectar and seeds and that many are sterile. So go to Mount Cuba and take a look at their research. They've researched Baptisia and, and they've set a grad student out there to count how many in the diversity of, of um, insects that visit these uh, native ours. Um, but Again, I would, to be very safe, I would stick with straight species, not cultivars. And remember that pollinators are not just bees, they're wasps and beetles and ants and hummingbird moths and butterflies. So um, just re recognize uh, the diversity that you're, you're aiming for. Look at this, Coria, this is one of uh, Mount Cuba's um, uh, research projects and, and they counted how many of each bee uh, species were, were found on Coreopsis. Okay. Heather Holm is a great uh, resource. She has generously put lists of plants for bumblebees, plants for wasps. She has a new book out on wasps. So look her up and uh, go, to, go to this website, thepollinatorsnativeplants.com and there are many, many uploads that you can take, take um, for free and very kindly, kind of her. Um, there is some research uh, that's been done on monarchs and, and I don't think it's definitive, but it's worth knowing about and trying maybe in your yard. Um, the researchers planted three different gardens and they, they mixed up milkweeds and flowering nectar sources 
and um, grasses in different configurations. And in one configuration, the monarch eggs and the larva were two to four times more abundant when they were evenly spaced in a one meter corridor around the perimeter. So A, the, so these are the, these are the um, plants that they used and the, the milkweed with the Asclepias incarnata around the edges spaced a meter apart, <laughs> yielded much, many more monarch eggs and larva. I found that interesting. I don't think it's um, ultimately conclusive, but I think it's worth um, more study. Winter sowing is a great way to uh, get seeds for cheap and, um, you know, seeds fall to the ground. They get snowed on, they get rained on, they get trampled on, some of them get eaten, but that's the way new plants start. So winter sowing just replicates that in a more controlled fashion with um, recycled uh, milk jugs. You can go to a winter sowing Facebook page. Generally, the information there is pretty good. Uh, it's a good way to get a lot of plants for a lot less money. Uh, Penn State has a paper on winter sowing. You can Google that, but it's also in my references. Hey, Nancy, just a heads up. Uh, there's 10 minutes until the Q&A. Okay. Oh, perfect. I think. Yeah, you're on track. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Thanks. grow Growing a meadow is just like any other kind of gardening. It requires maintenance, especially the first few years. And burning is a good technique, you know, a controlled burn, but we're not allowed to do that in most of our neighborhoods. Um, uh, you, you can weed whack once annually or mow and maybe reseed some areas, but you're always scouting for woody vegetation moving in because that meadow wants to secede into a forest again. So if you want to keep out woody uh, material, um, scout for those and scout for invasives while you're at it too. I'm, I've already been out looking for the garlic mustard this week. So your winter meadow, Alonzo referred to this, those seeds are filled with carbohydrates and proteins and those stems provide habitat in the winter for beneficial insects, but it's also beautiful. This is a picture by Pete Ondoff. Uh, and I love his designs. He's not strictly native, but I, um, I think you can borrow some of his ideas to um, replicate with natives. So here's a, this is a plant in my yard. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, this is a stem on the right. And that stem is filled with little baby bees. So instead of the bee house that they, they didn't really need because, you know, what were they doing long before those were sold in stores. I mean, they were in the plant stems. And so they had laid their egg in there and stuffed it full of sawdust and mud. And um, it, it thrilled me to just find that. This is a little poem um, at Potomac Library. If you ever get a chance to go over there and this a designer um, wrote this poem about flower bones. Please let us stay. We are homes and food. We are their hosts. So to mow or not to mow, um, leave, leave it standing for winter, in winter for birds. There are birds all over my stems in the backyard um, and leave a portion for them. And then the second and subsequent years, you probably don't wanna mow the first year, but the second and subsequent years, you can mow annually if you want to. But remember the beneficial insects use those stems until they hatch. Um, so cease mowing, weed whacking from the end of April through late July, nesting season for bunnies and maybe some ground nesting birds. Or you can use hand pruners. I don't, I don't generally mow. I, use, I come in with my hand pruners, take out diseased stuff and any stems that have um, you know, fallen over and need, or need to be removed. Just to be safe for birds, delay your mowing until late September. For weeding, you're always just scouting for weeds and invasives because every, every place that they can, they're gonna pop up. You can cut perennial weeds at the ground um, rather than pulling them completely out. That way you're disturbing the soil less because the more you disturb the soil, the more weed seeds come to the surface. The first year you can consider a nurse crop. This picture here shows, I don't know if that's the oats. I put oats around some seed, seeded areas. This is crimson clover to pr protect the soil um, in a couple bare areas until I could get uh, native perennials in there. And again, know, the, know what your weeds are. You, know, you can always send a picture 
to the extension office and we can help you ID it um, if that will be would be helpful and we give you non can give you non chemical recommendations for how, how best to manage it. So here's a few takeaways. The sign of a great gardener is you've got to eat in plants. You know, when, when I first started at Extension, clients would call us and say, something is eating my plants. What can I do to kill it? And that's not, that has changed so much, thankfully, over the years that I've been with Extension. So expect your plants to, to be eaten. You, maybe you're thinking, I can't commit to a meadow. This is too much. Uh, it might be too much work. And even if you start, oops, excuse me. So how about a little pollinator garden? You know, all the other great speakers that we have can talk to that. Or hell strip between the street and your sidewalk. That could become a mini meadow. Uh, you could do a hedgerow of native shrubs or a little pocket meadow. Or you could do a pollinator garden that expands a little bit every year. So Thomas Rainier um, is a great designer. Um, and he says, let's think of, I'm gonna paraphrase this, let's think of our lawns as not wall-to-wall -wall carpet, but area rugs. So if there's a place where your kids like to play and they wanna kick the soccer ball or play Frisbee, that keep that as turf, but then convert the rest of the area around it. Let's take the border and explode it out of the box, he says. And, we, and Nancy says, would you please stop trying to grow turf in wet, shady, difficult to most spots and grow natives instead? So Master Gardeners are Audubon Home Ambassadors. You can contact us and get a free visit to your property. We're not there to judge your landscaping or, or talents or your how many weeds you have. We all have weeds too. We're there to help you determine how to improve habitat and if you have a certain number of species then you can get one of these signs that's on my yard. I want to mention our extension horticulture help desk. Uh, we answer questions about wildlife and insects and disease, plant diseases and plant problems just a wide variety and so uh, you can get a hold of us at mastergardener at pwcgov.org and we have Weekly Wednesday classes at 11 o'clock. These are the three that are coming up soon. Um, you can email the Master Gardener desk to get more information about those classes. They're all free classes. They're all on Zoom. They're one hour long. So I, um, I would encourage you to look, check it out. And here's the Plant Nova Natives website. Uh, Chesapeake Bay Native Plant Center also has some really good documents for, for looking at um, and helping you plan. Um, our, these are all of our social media channels and we put good stuff on there, all educational material, and we'd love to have you join us. Um, we share our, all of our classes too. Uh, here's the first of a resource. So the Xerxes Society, um, uh, Earned Seed is a great resource. They have a lot of um, really great resource guides. Um, Native Plant Seedling Identification, that's the NRCS. Um, and then Million Pollinator Challenge and NRCS also has a, a document for establishing pollinator menus because I can't cover everything you need to know today. Uh, Sam Droji, the, the guy who had the one hour meadow, he has an Instagram account that is, that is fantastic. You should follow him. Uh, he has fantastic bee photography. I learned so much from him. Uh, Xerxes has a meadow guidelines um, document and here's Heather Holmes uh, plant list sites for the you know specialist flowers for wasps. Um, University of Kentucky this is the the website from the milkweed planting strategies if you want to read that yourself. And here's the entrance to my my meadow and I, I have a six foot nine son and he gets really irritated <laughs> he can't make it into the meadow without knocking into all the bees and plants. So anyway, I'm happy to entertain some questions now. Okay, thank you, Nancy. I always enjoy your talks. Um, we do have a lot of good questions. I hope I get to them all. So uh, Daniel wants to know about watering. Can a meadow be on a slope and not have to water? Yeah, 
um, most native plants are pretty drought tolerant once you get them established. But those first two years, you do have to pay attention. And if, of course, it depends if you're using, you know, plugs or seeds. The plugs and seeds need really careful monitoring until like the third year. Um, but perennials in a pot, I, I would say the first year, year and a half, you know, even anytime the ground is not frozen, they're going to need a good soaking once a week. Okay. And Jean asked about, can you create meadows interplanted with a few trees? Sure. You, you can. That wouldn't technically be a meadow because meadows don't have woody vegetation, but that would be a lovely, lovely addition to the landscape, I think. You know, just mm -hmm. natives around uh, tree areas. Uh, make sure that they are ones that are, you know, can handle the shade. And if there's any uh, chemical effects from the tree, like a black walnut, uh, sends out chemicals uh, that deter some plants from growing well. You know, you, you just got to pick the right. Right plant, right place. <laughs> right. Okay. And Jenny has foxholes on a very steep hill. Um, do you have any tips for getting along with the foxes? <laughs> what about putting something like using a, a native grass on that hill so it kind of hid the foxholes, gave them more coverage. I, I had the ground, I had three groundhog holes in my front yard. I, I don't know, I, that, that's probably what I would do. Oops, oh, sorry. Um, I, that's probably what I would do. I mean, grasses. It's a joy to have foxes though. Mm -hmm. Rodent, yeah, someone commented that it's rodent control. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, and uh, Laureen is interested to hear about what you planted under the shade of a tree. I think your black walnut is what she was referring to. Um, have, she says her meadow is under a large oak tree. Okay. Um, those Sam Droji ones, the Heliopsis, Halotinoides, um, cup plant uh, did well under there. Uh, great blue lobelia, um, wing stem, uh, the um, bone set, um, all of those are could, could handle the, those characters, but you know, they're all, they're all pretty, they're all vying for a, <laughs> they're all fighting each other out there in the summer, you know, try, one's trying to get above the other. Someone suggested wild ginger. Oh, in, in a tree? 80 spot under a oak tree, definitely. Good. But that's a, that would be a low grower. Okay. Um, Jean is asking about starting seeds with a just a thin layer of compost. Some seeds need to, uh, some native seeds need to be scarified. They need to be nicked or frozen and thawed. So it depends on the seed and some like light and some need to germinate in dark. So it would really depend on the seed. If you wanna send us an email about a specific species, we can help you out. Yeah. Um, and Laureen tried solarizing last year, um, but it does not work well if you have any elevation or slope on your land. Um, she's wondering uh, if she did something wrong or how, how to fix that. She tried what? Uh, solarizing. Oh, solarizing. <laughs> on, on a slope, it looks like. Yeah, because it probably didn't get hot enough. So it's possible on a slope, it's just, it just didn't get hot enough, you think was the problem? Oh, you know, and were the edges down? Did you water it really carefully, really deep? Oops. Did you water it really deeply beforehand and make sure the sides were um, closed down? Um, I, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work on a slope. Okay, that's good to know. Um, let's see. Joy, if that's you, if that's you, the Master Gardener intern, I would be glad to work with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were a couple questions about the weed whacking and mowing. Mm -hmm. um, Lorraine asked if you could explain more about weed whacking. Uh, when is this done and how do you avoid accidentally whacking down the plants that you want there? Yeah, I, I don't... 
I don't really weed whack. You can do it once a year, you know, when it's not nesting season, but so, I don't do it. I go in with a hand pruner and I, I take a few, if I don't want bee balm to be everywhere, I'll take a few of the seed heads off and, and I'll leave the stems for the whole winter until spring, um, like late spring. And then I'll cut, cut them down and put them in the compost. Okay. Um, so if you mow once a year, Elizabeth is asking what month is recommended? I would mow in the late fall, like late, late fall. maybe late September. Okay, and would it work to mow every other year? Yeah, there's no reason. We have a master gardener who has uh, like a half an acre meadow and he doesn't ever mow it. Well, no, he mows it once a year uh, when he gets around to it. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> And Susan wants to know what prevents a nurse annual plant from re-sowing and becoming an issue? That good, that's a really good question. Um, the nurse plant that I use was oats. And so it, as soon as the hot weather comes, it just dies back. And if the seeds fall down there, it won't germinate until maybe the next winter because it's cool, cool season. So Ernst Seed Company has... Um, some good information on that. They're the ones that taught me about that. What seed company? E-R-N-S-T, Ernst. Ernst, okay, okay, good. Your resources on there are really good. Not okay. that I'm promoting a business, really. <laughs> oh, right. They're yeah, just really educationally that. focused. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have five more minutes and a few more questions, so we're good on time. Um, I have a sunny yard and an aggressive perennial Bermuda, maybe grass that creeps underground and takes over everything, making the idea of creating a meadow overwhelming. Yes. Which meadow prep method would be most effective for killing it? Is there a good way to manage it going forward for larger yards? So he, he wants- It's to really it. tough. Mm -hmm. um, I, guess, I guess if it was me, I know I have finite energy. I might pick a small area and try to cl clear out the Bermuda. I've done that in, my, in a couple places in my yard. Um, you can use herbicides um, as a last resort and I, we could certainly walk you through. Um, but those, those roots of Bermuda grow so deep that herbicide application would need to be multiple times. Um, I don't think either the solarization or the occultation would, would be effective enough. So what I've, I've done is I've just mapped out a small area and I have tilled it, hand tilled it, and pulled out all the rhizomes that I could get out. It's so tedious. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't have the answer for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, trial and error. Okay. Uh, what was the plant you mentioned as liar leaf? Lyre leaf sage. Lyre leaf sage. Um, yes, salvia laurata. It's a great plant. Oh, Leslie answered. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> okay, uh, can a meadow in a utility easement survive being ripped up every three or four years? No. <laughs> no. I would avoid that area. Oh, that's unfortunate. You um, know, but, but they're planting meadows under a lot of the power lines, you know, to, to make habitat, which is a great idea. Yeah. Uh, what do you suggest for mulch if you have to use it? Uh, gold bean to create ground cover, uh, so mulch no longer needed but to start. Yeah, I would use uh, arborist wood chips. They're free. Um, there's good research that says they don't take the nitrogen out of the soil. Arborist um, wood chips, okay. Yeah. Okay. And <laughs> yeah. Um, Cal Heiser got kicked off and someone, and she needs to be let back in. I, I have people uh, constantly. Okay. If I see it, I will. Yes. I'm, I'm going to put her, you want me to put her phone number in the chat so you'll have it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I, uh, I'm trying to keep an eye on, you know, people get kicked out, but I don't see anything. No, so, yeah. I think she's totally off the Zoom is what it is. She needs okay. to be we had a question here. about an Asian ladybug. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> you know, they're here to stay. 
Okay. And Spotsylvania, they do have a master gardener program. Yay. For some, is that, I'm sorry, I'm asking. <laughs> do oh, they? Yeah. yeah, they do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So someone yeah. asked about that. Yep. Uh -huh. Good. And it's free. Um, so Asian ladybugs, leave them alone. And I think that was everything. Did I get everybody's questions? Breakout sessions ending in one minute. You got yeah. it. I wish I could oh. see you, but thank you for listening. And if you have questions, you can mention through the Master Gardener desk, mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Okay. Thanks a lot. Enjoy your day. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy.